All right, everybody, welcome back to another video here on Financial Friends. Today, we have a doozy of an episode for you this week in finance where I cover everything that I found interesting over the course of the last week here in finance. Let's go ahead and dive into some of the news. Before we do so, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button as well. It does help the channel. We're on the road to 1,000 subscribers and also your commentary is crucial to the success of this channel long term so any point during this video you see something you want to comment on comment down below i will reply and get back to everyone without further ado the stories from this week in finance president joe biden did sign a bill that allowed the U.S. to get some more investment into semiconductors. $52 billion will be provided to U.S. companies and billions more as a tax credit. Now, I want to get away from the fact of political debate, and I want to get to something that is important for the United States. Could we or could we not have spent more money? Yes. Could we or could or should we not have spent this at all? Yes. That debate out the window. I'm not going to be discussing whether we should or shouldn't have or did or didn't, whatever. The point of the matter is the United States has been dominant in the semiconductor industry for a while, and I hope that we can continue to be because semiconductors are used in literally everything. We all would like to see more things made in the United States. We all would like to see U.S. workers have opportunity. We would all like to see innovation happen in the United States. This bill can help aid that in literally every aspect. Semiconductors run our lives. Television, personal computer, mobile phone, automobile, and advanced medical care. This website was probably made 2,000 years ago. It looks brutal. No offense to Hitachi. Um, but nonetheless, we use semiconductors in literally everything. And they also made note, make note here, in air conditioners, in rice cookers, in CPUs, washing machines, refrigerators, LED light bulbs, ATM, trains, everything. We use them in everything. And so if we want to innovate, we're going to need semiconductors. Let's produce them here in the United States. We'll never have to rely on anybody else for them. We can supply the world with them. This could be a driver of industry in the United States moving forward. I like this bill for really that reason and that reason only. All right, Coinbase. Coinbase down because crypto down. Coinbase goes up when crypto goes up. That's the fact of the matter here. We saw that this quarter. Earnings, not good. $4.98 lost per share. That was nearly double expectation of $2.65. And a revenue miss as well, $808 million versus the 832 expected. Coinbase's revenue declined 64%. The retail transaction revenue came in at 16.6 million, or I'm sorry, $616 million. That's down 66%. And it's also below the 667 million that was expected. You can see this makes up nearly all of their revenue, all but about 200 mil. So when you have a business whose revenue comes from crypto transactions and you don't have a lot of crypto transactions because crypto is going down and people don't wanna be in it, don't care to invest anymore, the hype's not there. This is what happens. That's about it. Elon Musk. He, of course, makes the news again. I'm pretty sure he's been in every episode. Nonetheless, $7.92 million worth of Tesla shares sold, $6.88 billion worth. And right now, I'm sorry, off topic. If you're thinking that I'm like an Elon Musk, like avid follower, I'm really not. I'm trying to pull the most relevant news each and every week. And I feel as if something he does is relevant. This is relevant because he was forced to do this. This was an insurance policy for him. He tweeted in reply to someone saying, are you done selling? He says, and quote, yes. In the hopefully unlikely event that Twitter forces this deal to close and some equity partners don't come through, it is important to avoid an emergency sale of Tesla stock. Now, I would venture to say this was a sh an emergency sale of Tesla stock because he was still selling when he didn't want to sell. Let me know what you think about that in the comment section um, below. But nonetheless, Twitter has seemed to be a continual distraction for Elon Musk and could potentially cause a distraction even after this court case is finished. It's written down here, if the Twitter deal doesn't happen, he will con consider, pardon, creating his own social platform, x.com, he added. So Elon Musk would consider creating his own social platform after all of this goes bad. 
I'm not saying anything, but I am saying this seems to be a distraction moving forward. <laughs> the biggest story that I really have this week, a lot here on Disney, Disney blew subscriber growth out of the water, beat on the top line, beat on the bottom line, did well in parks. This was a fantastic quarter for Disney, and you can see it reflected in their stock price. Currently, as I am filming this, it's about 2.16 in the afternoon. Stock is up 5.41% the day after, record, or after reporting these earnings. The numbers... We'll dive through them really quick. We'll get to some more analysis in a second. A dollar and nine cents per share of EPS versus 96 cents expected. Beat on revenues 21.5 billion versus the 20.96 billion expected. And total Disney Plus subscriptions 152.1 million versus the 147.76 million expected. These were fantastic numbers coming out of Disney. I believe they added something in the neighborhood of. Um, 14 something total million subscribers a great quarter but their quarter brought along with it some changes price changes to disney to hulu and previously they already happened to espn plus i made a little graphic i want to dive into the numbers i want to talk about why they did this but first the numbers okay i will explain really why all this is happening afterwards disney ads Disney with ads, it's going to be $7.99. Hulu is going to follow in suit with that, raising the price from $6.99 to $7.99. Now, if you want to go no ads on either platform, you're going to see a price increase $7.99 to $10.99 on the Disney side, $12.99 to $14.99 on the Hulu side. That goes into effect October 10th. And then already in effect is the, Di or the ESPN, pardon, the ESPN Plus price increase of $6.99 to $9.99. Now, why are they doing this? Well, very blatantly, and I think obviously probably to this point to you, when you add an ad-supported version in there, you create a new price tier. It is up to you to determine whether that price tier should be lower than the current price, or should it be in line with or above that the current price of the, of the platform. The current price was $7.99. That has no ads on it. They're increasing that price, and they're going to fill that that cheaper slot, that $7.99 slot everyone was used to paying, and they're going to have ads on it. Now, why are they doing this? Why are they not lowering the price for ESPN Plus? The reason is streaming's not profitable. It just isn't profitable for them yet. Disney Plus, Hulu, and ESPN Plus combined for a loss of $1.1 billion just this quarter. That's a lot of money. And when you have good growth, 14 some million subscribers increased, so it says here about 15 million new subscribers, then you know you have price flexibility. You have the pricing power because demand was so much higher than what analysts expected. And so for that reason, they raised prices. And hopefully this drives future profitability, which will make shareholders happy as well. Now, further diving into this, we have all of the different bundles if you want to get ESPN, I'm sorry, if you want to get Disney Plus and Hulu with ads, $10. If you want to get with ads, Disney, Hulu, and ESPN Plus, $13. If you want no ads on Disney, but ads on Hulu and ESPN, which ESPN has no ads, at least to my knowledge, on the library of content. And then on the live side of content, there is ads. Nonetheless, no ads Disney, ads for Hulu and ESPN. It's going to go up to $14.99, $15. And with no ads on any of the platforms, $20. Okay, that was a mouthful. That was a lot to talk about. Uh, go back in the video, screenshot or screen record um, these price changes. There's a whole article on it that I am going to link. That's going to be this article here. I just felt the article was messy. There's so much going on in it. So I wanted to break the numbers down a little bit clearer. Now, among all of this happening all this noise, all this craziness, they lowered guidance moving forward. I think this is big because they were expecting 230 to 260 million subscribers. That's what they were expecting by 2024. They since lowered that among a very strong quarter for them by 15 million subscribers. Why did they do that? Well, I think, and I believe that with the recession, it's kind of looming. They're probably not expecting as good of growth. And they figured now's a good time to lower guidance, lower expectations on, you know, investors and analysts, because if they, you know, su or, uh, surprise, I'm sorry, pardon, to the upside, that's great news. 
but with all the price changes coming in, this could affect the demand a little bit for the product, especially moving forward. People's pocketbooks are tightening. I've said that phrase a thousand times now. So they might not see as many ads as they thought. And what a better time to announce a lower of guidance than when you blow numbers out of the water and people are distracted about all the good news that's going on. I think that demonstrates the 5.5% increase in the stock price. All right. We take a sip of water here. We'll move on to the next story. Google and Apple trading blows. Google decides to criticize um, Apple. I feel like this is like a child's fight here. It's like, oh, we're Android. We control so much of the world and we have Google and oh my gosh, we're so large. And then Apple's like, oh, well, we own like 55% of, you know, US iPhone or, or cell phone demand. Nah, like just absolute two monster companies going back and forth. But nonetheless, um, Google basically says, look, Apple, we know you, we know that you know you're hurting texting for customers. You're the reason that Android users are being blamed for the green bubble. Because you, Apple, will not switch your mind and you will not come to the RCS type of uh, texting platform. I don't know all the details here, but I can see RCS is a next generation standard for text messaging. And I've heard before, Apple runs on an old version of texting. Their iMessage supports blue bubbles. It has the notification for when people are typing. It allows you to send anything Apple linked, you know, music, images, things like that. It allows you to specially send them to other iPhone users, and it even allows for texting on Wi-Fi. So right now, if you text an iPhone from an iPhone, you have a A-class experience. But if you text an iPhone to an Android, the Android user has a terrible experience, and Apple wants it to be that way so that that Android user will switch to iPhone and get a better texting experience. Again, these are just two massive companies kind of trading blows going back and forth. Apple's not going to change. Okay, we all know Apple's not going to change. Why are they not going to change? They have 55% of the U.S. market for cell phones or smartphones, I guess I should say. Um, that's over half, which means there's an over half, a over 50% chance you're probably texting, if it's within the United States, another iPhone user. So half the people are already happy because everything that you own that's Apple, your Apple TV, your iPad, your Mac, your laptop, your Apple Watch, it all connects. It all is connected to your iPhone. So why are you going to have a Mac, an iPad, a MacBook, a I, Apple iWatch, or an, an Apple Watch, an Apple TV, and then get an Android? You're not. And Apple has looped you into the ecosystem by creating a premium product experience, a good texting experience, a good viewing experience, a seamless experience, and you're not just going to uproot all of that because you've probably spent thousands of dollars accumulating all of those products. They're just going to keep trading blows. Apple is never going to change unless there is regulatory scrutiny. Then they might. All right, social media. This has been under regulatory scrutiny as well, but Pew Research, P-E-W Research, did an absolutely fantastic study for us. From 2014 to now 2022, they monitored the change in teens, ages 13 to 17, their social media usage. So big numbers, big stories coming out of this particular piece of research. Google's winning the game. 95% of teens said they used YouTube. That's why I'm on YouTube now, because I believe in the future of YouTube. It's going to be the biggest platform for video watching ever will continue to be forever at least for now they have an absolute monopoly on the game anyways google's winning meta kind of falls somewhere in the middle of this pack they saw about a 10 percent increase in instagram usage over the course of this study but <laughs> a massive decrease in facebook usage from 71 percent down to 32 percent. so at its height it was bigger than tiktok at least currently um, and it is now less than double TikTok. TikTok has taken over. TikTok comes in with 67% of usage, which makes the YouTube number even more impressive. Instagram comes in with 62% usage. That is up from the 52%. And that's why it feels if, you know, Meta kind of falls somewhere in the middle because they gave up some form of uh, Facebook 
usage, but they made portions of that back up with Instagram usage. Instagram is a more clickable, a more viewable, uh, a more laughable social media to have. That's what drives social media usage today. It's no longer genuine connection with your friends and family and posting authentic and real content. It's instead sensationalism. Can you get clicks? Can you get likes? Can you get follows? And can I use it to distract myself for 20 minutes in the car versus actual getting engaging content out of that? And for that reason, Twitter has declined in usage for teens as well. Twitter has turned into exactly what Elon Musk has described it as, this de facto town hall, this town hall-like news-based experience. Teenagers could care less about that, and they just want to see funny videos that TikTok can supply them, and that's why TikTok controls 67% of uh, teen phones, or is on 67% of teenagers' phones. Snapchat increases about 18% from 41% up to 59% of usage via teens. I think this one's kind of self-explanatory. You can send a picture in three seconds and a picture tells a thousand words. Visuals where we are, simply words are going away. The other important numbers that came in, uh, Twitch 20, sees 20% 20 usage, WhatsApp 17% usage, Reddit sees 14% usage, and Tumblr a measly 5%. Let me know your thoughts on these numbers. I think this is one of the easier topics to discuss in the comments because we're all on some of these platforms. And if you're watching this, more than likely you are on YouTube, which so are 95% of US teens. Inflation data, this is the last story I have here today. We saw 8.5% CPI increase year over year, an expectation of 8.7%, so a beat, if you will, on that expectation. 0% month over month inflation versus the 0.2% estimated, 5.9% core year over year versus the 6.1% expected, and 0.3% month over month core versus the 0.5% expected. A lot of numbers thrown your way. The big takeaway and probably the one that caught your eye, 0% inflation. Our president said we had, US, or had no inflation. That is, while true month over month, that's not the case. That's not the story. That's not what Americans are feeling. That's been a general consensus that he was wrong in saying that, I think, among literally everybody, because we've all felt that price increases across the board. Like, it, it, it's in our everyday lives. Americans don't believe for a second that we have zero inflation. Now, we do have 0% inflation month over month, and that is a good moral victory as a starting point. Let me show you some numbers here. Here in this chart, we could see a peak, if you will. This is 2022 June number, 9.1%. That's now down to 8.5%, which means we didn't generally see inflation, 0%. That means this could be the peak, and that is a moral victory. Now, we have a long way to go, and the Federal Reserve has messaged this. Rates are still probably going to go up, whether it's 0.5 or 0.75, who knows? But the point is we have one solid data point. We need more and we need to see more moving forward. Producer price index. This is the kind of wholesale numbers that we do get here. 0.5% decrease. This is good. This is good information because experts have now said we expect producer prices to continue to ease as supply chains improve. We got the first inkling of that with a 0.5% decrease here in July. Finishing the quote, it could take up to three months for improved supply chains to affect on the consumer end, meaning consumer prices could continue to either flatline or decrease as producers stop feeling the effects of inflation. So with all that being said, thank you for sticking with me this whole episode. I really do appreciate it. Comment your thoughts on all stories down below. Hit the like button if you enjoyed all this coverage, all this content that I am pumping out here on the YouTube channel. I do appreciate all of your support. Hit subscribe if you're not already. Hit the bell right next to that. That way you're notified when a new video comes out. And I will see you all in the next one. Take care.